and are across the street. That used to be the old courthouse, and that my father-in-law and mother-in-law were in his judge's chambers waiting for my husband to get out of the dental chair. So the building drops my husband's life and the life of the dentist saved by the dental chair. With all the steel in the dental chair, it held up the trusses from the third floor and kept them from being crushed. So the dentist pulls my husband out onto the street, dazed, confused, and still under anesthesia. He turns to the dentist and says, no, Kane's really scary, huh? <laughs> he thinks he's having a dental delusion all the way to the dental office. His mother had told him about the effects of anesthesia. So he thought a whole earthquake was part of the, the anesthesia, the effect of the anesthesia. So I didn't really even have time to even uh, be as afraid as he would have been had uh, he uh, known it was an earthquake. To the left of the trolley, the Eisenhower Alaska Statehood Monument. This statue is affectionately called here in Anchorage, Ike on a half shell. It's a very strange statue there. His head looks like a little oyster there. Uh, we became a state January 3rd, 1959, and every day in Alaska, oh, we like Ike Day. There were 45,000 Americans living here disenfranchised. In other words, they voted in U.S. presidential elections, but because Alaska was a territory, that was an advisory vote, much like Puerto Rico. Just to give you the impact of that, my mother-in-law voted for president the very first time when she was 19 years old, living in the lower 48, married my father-in-law at 21 and moved to Alaska. The next time her vote counted in the U.S. presidential election was 32 years later. So folks, when you go to the polls this November, Think about us Alaskans up here and how we had to wait such a very long time to have our votes count. We're approaching the Alaska River right now. This is the whole reason why Anchorage is here as a town. In 1904, huge coal passes were discovered across our inlet, and there was a rich market for that coal in the Orient if we could just get it there. Control the alert service started. Logically, stick the coal in a barge and ship it to the Orient. But our harbor out there is 11 feet deep at low tide and 45 feet deep at high tide. Anchorage has one of the highest tide differentials in the world, second only in the Northern Hemisphere to the Bay of Fundy up in Canada. So the coal could not be shipped out of here. It had to be shipped out of the nearest deep water port. That was Seward, 118 miles from here. Now, how in the world were we going to get 23,000 tons of coal to Seward in a state with no roads? We needed a train, and we needed it badly. Two private companies go bankrupt trying to capitalize on the fortune that was made in transporting this coal. Finally, it's realized there's only one entity with deep enough pockets to build in Alaska. That was the federal government. This is the only rail line ever built by our country. So the federal government arrives with 2,000 men, and those men live right where you are now sitting in a 1,000 insulated army tents for two years. And that's how Anchorage becomes a town. We were the staging area for the building of the Alaska Railroad to harvest all this coal here in Alaska. Now, a little-known fact about Alaska, we have the largest known coal reserves in the world. Alaskan coal is anthracite, that's the good stuff that burns so clean. It is purchased by the country of South Korea and transported there where they use it to make their electric energy there. So we have lots of coal, lots of oil, lots of gold, lots of moose, lots of salmon. Everything's big in Alaska. Anybody have any questions about the railroad or anything? Uh, I want you to think about this, ladies. A thousand men living, uh, 2,000 men living in a thousand tents. Only one of the tents was a bath tent. <laughs> <laughs> so the bears were afraid of them. They didn't have to worry about bear attacks. Those guys were pretty stinky. I had three daughters. They couldn't share a bathroom cordially. <laughs> 2,000 men sharing one shower. To the left of the trolley, the Alaska Railroad, notice the device, the little engine number one, notice the device on the front of engine number one. That little device is called a moose gooser. Now, back in the early days of Anchorage, this little train had a unique job. He'd go out on the tracks after giant snowstorms, not only to clear the snow, but to bump the moose in the behind and get them off the train tracks so it wouldn't derail a bigger train uh, coming behind. So that's called a moose gooser. Now all of our young couples uh, like to show up with a photographer and take their wedding engagement photos right there. To the right of the trolley, the mouth of Ship Creek, some of our fishermen are still there. The tide is now on the way out. It was up about two hours ago. So what should be happening now is the salmon that came in two hours ago should almost be up to the salmon observation deck. We can actually take a ride down with uh, on the factory trolley and uh, see those salmon. Or take a walk down with the scene. It's about a 15-minute walk to walk down there to see the salmon at the observation deck. So after the railroad was done, 600 of the men stayed in Alaska to make it their home. They sent for their wives and children. They wrote up a speech for it. Alaska 
stop. I've been calling you Anchorage for two months. Stop. Your name is Anchorage. Stop. So that's how we got our names. Some random guy in the post office in Seattle liked that name better than Alaska City. And to the right of the trolley now is the Cook Inlet, and it's named after famous British explorer James Cook, who's credited for having discovered Alaska. Cook left England in July of 1776, commissioned to find a short trail route between England and China. He was looking for a river that would connect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, and called this imaginary river called West Passage. In, in three years of looking for it, he discovered New Zealand, Tahiti, and Hawaii. arm because Captain Cook had to turn again his ship. Now, uh, I don't know if you can see the mountain he's looking at. She's called the Sleeping Lady. Can you see it? It's a woman with her head off to the to the left and then her left shoulder, left hip. You can see her name, Sleeping Lady? Say yes if you see her. Yes, okay. I'll tell you a story about her in a minute. Um, so you can see her right here as well. So Cook leaves Anchorage, continues sailing north for another 1,100 miles. He arrives at the Bering Sea Strait in November of 1778. The Bering Sea Strait, a 26-mile stretch of ocean water, it separates Alaska from Russia. It was frozen solid. Discouraged, Cook could not go any further north. He turned his ship around and went back to the Hawaiian Islands he had discovered on an earlier voyage that officially makes him the first Alaskan to go to Hawaii for Christmas. Now we all try to go. Um, beneath us to the right you can see our mud flats. They surround the coastline of Alaska. Sometimes people ask me if that's the land that dropped on the night of the earth, but it is not. Anchorage has an elevation of roughly 145 feet above sea level and the land dropped up here on the bluff and it dropped anywhere from 11 to 45 feet on that night. So the land down there is Alaska actually getting larger. As glaciers continue to crush millions of pounds of rock and sediment, it creates a very fine soil called glacial silt. This silt is then washed down to the inlet by the rivers, and when it hits the silt, it becomes heavy and deposits. Thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of glacial silt hit our coastline every single year, adding up almost 10 acres to the land the state of Alaska. So our state gets larger every single year than these glacial silt deposits. So once Cook got back to the Hawaiian Islands, his men got into an altercation with the Hawaiians. He was killed. His first officer took command of the ship and sent him back to him. That first officer was the infamous Captain Brian Bly, the same Captain Bly from the Mutiny on the Bounty of Sarah when he was gone by. So two of England's most famous sea captains were both here in Anchorage in July of 1778. Um, Bly and Cook were such incredible seamen. The maps, Bly was his cardiographer, so he was the map maker on board his ship. The maps made between Cook and Bly were so accurate they were used by the British Navy until 1901. They were used by the Canadian fishing fleet in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia until 1951. They were the most accurate maps of where the fish could be found. They were replaced by, guess what? sonar fish finders. That was the first time that anything was more accurate than where Cook said you would find the fish from his mapping of all that area. Uh, Bly was pretty amazing too. When he was thrown off the bounty, he and his men were in, in these very small kind of like dinghies with sails. They were able to sail some 600 miles away to the Tongan Islands. Uh, um, Tongan Islands, uh, basically, and they navigated by the stars. And amazing. I happened to uh, had the opportunity to do a. I was a school teacher, and I taught this seminar called uh, Theater in the Classroom, where you could teach history. And I was actually invited to the Tongan Islands. It's a long story about how that happened. So I end up there, and every fourth person I met was named Bly. Uh, Captain Bly was on that island for eight months, and he was pretty busy. Everybody traces their genealogy back to him. Now this is our park strip. It's one block wide and 14 blocks long, and it was originally built as a fire buffer zone back in 1920 to protect Anchorage from forest fires. A little known fact about Alaska, we have massive forest fires in the summer. They come in seven year cycles, so this is the summer of the low cycle, so we, we haven't had a fire this summer. very so 
seldom destroys public property. Now these forest fires are essential to our ecosystem. The, the dead brush from the year before is so thick in Alaska that when the snow smushes it down, it creates an entire layer preventing sunlight from getting to the forest floor. Well, our forest fires are caused by lightning storms. The lightning strikes this dry brush, sets it afire. The first plant that grows up out of the wilderness, the willow tree. Willow is essential to our ecosystem, is the primary diet of moose. Uh, in the summer, they eat beautiful green vegetation. In the winter, they eat 25 pounds of willow bark a day. So forest fires in Alaska are not a bad thing. They are essential to the survival of one of our major uh, resources, which is moose meat. Now in the distance, you can again see the Sleeping Lady, the original inhabitants of Anchorage were the Athabascans. The Athabascans believed they were preceded here by a race of giants. Um, in one of the battles, the chief's son was killed. Um, he came back, the chief came back to tell his daughter while she was well, found her sleeping. There she still sleeps. The legend continues that one day we will awaken in Anchorage, the sleeping lady will be gone. And on that day, we will know there will never be another war. So that's the uh, Athabascan legend of the sleeping lady from the from Anchorage, Alaska, from our Athabascan tribe. The Athabascans, by the way, here in Alaska, speak the exact same language as the Apaches in Arizona. Kind of interesting, isn't it? To the left of us now, West Anchorage High School, the first modern high school of Alaska, completely destroyed on the night of the earthquake. Miraculously, not a single student died inside. It was Good Friday. The building was closed. Now, ironically, a basketball game was supposed to have been played that night at 5, at five o'clock, and uh, mothers went storming in the principal's office complaining because that meant their boys would go to church on Good Friday. So he moved the game to Saturday afternoon instead. Well, the earthquake hit at 5.31, just 31 minutes after that game would have started, and the North American fault line went right through the middle of the gym, pulled it apart, and slammed it together like a, a wood chopper, chopped up that school like it had been a wood chopper. An estimated 2,000 people would have been in the gym. It's now called the miracle of West Anchorage High School. To the left of us now, we have all these trailers in downtown Anchorage. They are indicative of the former boom and bust economy that plagued Alaska for 100 years. In 1904, 200 Athabascans lived here. Then they discovered coal, boom, the population jumped up to 2,000. 1941, 30,000 Americans living here when World War II began. And when that happened, the Pentagon moved 30,000 troops to Anchorage to protect us from a potential foreign invasion. So we went from 30,000 to 60,000 in two months. 1968, 70,000 Americans living in Anchorage when they discovered oil and the population would go from 70,000 to 280,000 in a matter of four years. No possible way could the building industry keep up with that high demand for housing. And so for many, many Alaskans, their first home in the Great Land was a trailer home that they bought in the lower 48 and shipped up here. Well, most of the trailers have now been replaced with permanent construction. It has left us with an unusual effect on our architecture. In every single neighborhood of Anchorage, you find homes built right next door to each other in completely different decades, depending on when the family could afford to replace their trailer with a home. Perfect example to the left of us here. This beautiful home was built in 2001. There used to be three trailers right there until that day. Next door, these two homes built in the 50s. That little white house there in a minute, June Cleaver will come walking out the front door recognize the, the, their home. What about this home? Does anybody recognize this home and what era it would have come from? It's the Brady Bunch house, exactly. I don't know who said it, but you are exactly right. It's the same exact floor plan that the Brady Bunch had. So that house was built in about 1968. So in one neighborhood, 68, 55, and 2001. We have five major tribal groups in Alaska. Four of the, our native groups build their homes in the Arctic underground. Now they're built underground to get out of an amazing wind chill factor. For example, if it's minus 35 miles an hour and up there in the Arctic, a 100 mile an hour wind drives that temperature down to a minus 135. So in the Arctic, they tend to build their homes not on the hill, but in the hill. These underground homes are called Barra Barras, and to the right of us is the only one in Anchorage. This was built by the Isaacson family in 1985. It's um, the two skylights, so the only two windows in the back, thousand square feet of the home. You can see there are 14 steps leading down to Mrs. Isaacson's front door. Now there's a canopy over her uh, doorway because in 2012, Anchorage had uh, 12 feet of snow 
and she and her husband got tired of shoveling themselves out. In front of that canopy is her fireplace that goes down to her living room, uh, the fireplace in her living room. This house goes down for three floors. Uh, it has 40 inches of dirt piled against the walls and uh, over the ceiling. And in the dead of winter, her biggest heating bill last winter was $55. So uh, it's a very energy efficient manner in which to build a home in the Arctic. She does, however, have to mow her roof in the summertime. So that's a disadvantage of having an underground home. Um, I'm asked a lot about what homes cost in Anchorage. Uh, to the left of us here, this green home is a typical three bedroom, two bathroom, split level home. It's on a 2,400 square feet on a 12,000 square foot city lot. This home sold about three months ago for $385,000. I know, isn't that terrible? Pick up that home, move it directly across the inlet to the town of Wasilla, and in Wasilla, that home would be on an acre of land and cost you $170,000. Homes are exorbitantly more expensive in Anchorage because the city of Anchorage is out of land. To the east of us, the Chugach Mountains, 8,000 feet tall. On the on the other three sides of Anchorage, we have the Cook Inlet, so we are we are encased here. 43% of the population of our state lives in this one city. We've used up all the available buildable land here in Anchorage. Um, and so, uh, so it makes an acre of land here in Anchorage worth almost $100,000. Now, if you're standing at the Log Cabin Visitor Center in downtown Anchorage, you can look across the inlet to the town of Wasilla. From shoreline to shoreline, it's just a little over a quarter of a mile, but it's a 36-mile drive around the inlet to get there. Millions and millions of acres of land available in Wasilla, beautiful land. Why not build a bridge across there, those mud flats? The mud flats you see surrounding the coastline of Alaska, hundreds of feet deep. In the Cook Inlet, they're over 200 feet deep. There are places in the inlet we've never found the bottom. So to build a bridge, we would have to go down 20 stories deep through that mud to get a piling to get down to the bedrock. And then you have a 35 foot tide ripping on that foundation twice a day. So that kind of a bridge will not work. Well, what about a suspension bridge like they have in San Francisco? Well, that won't work either because we have ripping up and down that channel four to ten times a year, 100 mile an hour winds. So that wind would rip that bridge, it would twist that bridge like a pretzel, and then, in, uh, uh, and then it would snap and dump the cars into the inlet. So right now, we don't have a technology available that would make that land, uh, make that land available uh, through a make an easy drive to the land that's over there. Um, uh, Halliburton spent a year here in Anchorage, Halliburton trying to figure out how a tunnel could be erected under the inlet. That won't work either because when that inlet freezes, uh, it's a 35 foot, uh, 45 feet, and it freezes down almost 12 feet of ice. Well, when the tide comes up, it lifts these huge chunks of ice up into the air, and then when the tide goes back down, you have a two-story tall, huge chunk of ice. The weight of that ice would crush any tunnel they tried to build into that mud. So, so right now we don't really have a way to make ourselves to avail ourselves of that uh, land over there. So we're stuck with very expensive houses. Land in Wasilla is five to fifteen thousand dollars an acre. So our houses are a lot more expensive here. Well, right now, we're on our, almost out to Earthquake Park. This is where hundreds of homes rimming the coastline of Anchorage were destroyed on the night of the earthquake when the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate colliding over and over again, and in that last minute, that Pacific Platelet dropped. Now, around down in downtown Anchorage, it dropped 11 feet. Out here, it dropped 25 to 45 feet. Of the nine people who died in the earthquake in Anchorage, seven died out here when their homes built on the bluff slid into the icy waters of the Cook Inlet on that night. Altogether, only 139 people died from the worst earthquake in the history of North America. Remember, 13,000 people died in Japan from an earthquake that was 100 times less powerful than ours. Um, 139 died from the earthquake, 15 from the earthquake itself, the rest from the resulting tsunamis. Epicentered off the coast of Anchorage, the, the epicenter of this earthquake created a wave, one that traveled towards Alaska, one away from Alaska, headed south across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the earthquake wave that rippled towards Alaska killed 24 people in Valdez from a 98-foot tsunami wave that slammed into their town. Another wave hit Seward, Alaska, killing 16. Now, as this wave headed south, tsunami